The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Hi, guys. I'm Nancy Demmerdash. I'm uh, presenting today on uh, what as you can see from my title, Before the Scramble for Africa, Tracing African Architecture Through Trade, Circa 1200 Common Era. Um, what immediately comes to mind when you think of Africa? Anybody, shout out something. I won't penalize you. <laughs> <laughs> something, anything at all. I don't. Conflict diamonds. OK, diamonds, good one. New movie that just came out. Anybody else? Black people. Black people. Okay, even even better. That that's 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 true. Okay. Well, it's already a given that Africa is represented in the news and media, um, but the images that we have of Africa rarely go beyond the ubiquitous and um, often, you know, uh, very pejorative misconceptions and cliches of the continent. Uh, we're presented with a place that's always in the midst of disintegration and chaos. So we tend to approach Africa with a sense of pity. Now, um, in reality, there's much more going on and that at the public level, we're not always attuned to. Um, these are conventions that have become, you know, sort of cultural and social pathology in the West. And at this pathology, at the heart of it, um, is what curator Okwe and Wazer calls um, Afro-pessimism as you'll probably read in the in your readings for this week in um, the exhibition book, Snap Jud Judgments. So, you know, the great thing about the study of African, uh, of art and architecture, um, is that it finds ways to upset these pervasive Afro-pessimistic uh, conventions of imaging um, and that we're both very attracted to and dangerously immune to at the same time. Um, instead, what we want to do is raise vital questions on uh, and to propose new possibilities for the meaning of how we understand African culture and architecture um, before European colonization, well before 1200, um, which is the scramble for Africa, which I'm talking about. Now, um, just to reiterate, the BBC in 2006 issued um, this article asking, is Africa's architecture dying? Um, you know, I mean, obviously just the language right right there, I mean, the, the fact that, you know, it's it, death and, you know, um, and disintegration is, you know, entirely evident. Um, we have, let's just read some of these comments. This is an interview that was conducted. Um, we have Joshua, um, the architecture that is indigenous to Africa is too primitive. Africa has to move with recent, with recent advances in building construction. The need of the people in Africa has changed over the time. Therefore, buildings should be designed and built in a way that these needs are met. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, but, you know, is it primitive? <laughs> you know, is it, uh, is it, is it, you know, uh, on the decline, you know, I mean, these are, you know, and these are people living there, presumably, um, who espouse these opinions, you know, and going on, you have um, somebody like Vic Victor Chambers, Sierra Leone, uh, uh, who, who, someone from Sierra Leone who lives in Ghana, he says, is it only Ni in Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda buildings have been collapsing? Even in Europe and the United States, where perhaps they have better building structures, well-built buildings have been collapsing. Anyways, while we give the modern uh, give way to modern impressive architecture, we must not neglect our heritage in style and meaning. Well, but you know that's 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 all well and good too. Um, so you know the language perpetuates this notion that architecture is dying and that um, and that you know it, the, there's that there's no hope that you know it's a lost cause which is really something that today I hope that we can combat and um, really grapple with. So um, in this class, we're going to leave behind the political map that 
you guys, I'm sure, have all seen, you know, dozens and times, dozens of times in your upbringing and schooling. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to travel back. Um, and as I said, focusing on the year 1200 um, and try to understand the historical development of various architectural forms as a function of natural resources and the complex changing societies and trading economies that depended on these resources. Um, in tandem with this, we're going to see how different architectural typologies evolved and uh, were influenced by uh, environmental and climatic changes. Okay, so um, first let's let's take a look. Now, as, as a disclaimer, you know, and this came up uh, over the course of uh, the, the term, you know, I've been, you know, I've been grappling with a lot of these maps and, um, you know, for, for their lacks, for their absences, for, you know, a lot, a whole slew of problems that they present. Um, now, you know, but, um, so, you know, a lot of the maps that I show here will not always be, be perfect, but I will, you know, try to try my best to illustrate their, their flaws. Um, now, in, in the maps presented here, we have um, on the one uh, the image on the right. We have four uh, vegetation zones. Okay, so we have the the Sahara, which is this orange region, um, which is primarily desert. You know, you only find mostly camels, maybe a couple of goats here and there. Um, and here you have this uh, Sahelian semi-desert, which is not quite a savanna, but has you know patches of uh, of, of grass and so on growing intermittently and you'll find a lot more like goats and pastoralism. Basically as you uh, proceed south you'll find uh, the greater incidence of pastoralism. Um, and then you have this savanna region and the rainforest along the coastline. Um, so uh, and so some of these resources um, like salt which actually um, uh, was extracted uh, from the Sahara and gold, which is mined in um, present day uh, Ghana, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Guinea, Burkina Faso, um, Togo, and Benin. Um, you know, basically, this whole chunk of land is just uh, entirely full of chock full of gold. Um, and also you'll find iron, which on the um, image on the left, you'll find these black lines um, are showing the spread of iron working throughout the continent. Um, now, and, and that's something I'll get back to uh, later on as the, as the lecture progresses. But basically what I want you to see is how um, the, these resources also Hold on before I um, close. There's uh, cattle, domestication of cattle along this, this line right here. Um, and also um, from what is now Tunisia spreading southward. Um, but um, what I want you to see is that these goods really shape the flow um, throughout the continent um, of trade. OK. So this again shows the major trade routes, um, you know, in the yellow triangles like here um, and some of the white ones as well show where salt um, was extracted and also you have this orange copper source which is, um, you know, located right here, um, you know, the, the I mean, th this map is also problematic because it shows, you know, yes, it shows some east-west connectivity, but equally there was an important um, north-south axis of, uh, of dynamic uh, connection as well. Um, it, it ignores blatantly the foundries that um, you'd find in Axum, um, metal, metal foundries, um, and you know, as I mentioned, you know, this is one of the take home lessons for today that, you know, maps are constructs in the same way that history is a construct and we have to be critical of them. Okay, so 
Um, moving on to slide five, we have just, this is just an introduction to the, some of the great empires that arose um, as a result of these, you know, complex trading networks. Um, but, you know, because I'm focusing mainly on the period of like 1200, we're only going to be um, discussing the Ghana and Mali empires. Um, the image on the, on the left, I adapted sort of. Um, initially, the Iberian Peninsula and Saudi Arabia was not shaded purple, which is supposed to be the region where is Islam spread. Um, but yeah, I uh, uh, appropriated it a bit. Um, and you know, once again, there is this north-south axis, which isn't really being represented, and you know. This perhaps this map better accounts for the spread of like ironworking and cattle and so on that really was um, within that shift or yeah um, okay um, okay so you know prosperity generated through trade led to the growth of ur urbanization and certain um, settlements. Um, Cities along these trading routes, which you know you'll see central nodes here and there, um, really were crucibles of ideas and values and practices, um, you know that uh, that were spread, and it's pretty remarkable, as I hope you'll see. So where are we going today? Okay, um, we're going to start out in uh, Morocco, southern Morocco. Um, a fortress called um, the Kazba Ayat Ben Hadou. Um, we're then going to go down to the Great Mosque of Jenny in Mali and then go up slightly um, northeast to um, the Mopti region in Mali to, the, to see the Dogon communities. We're then going to sweep across um, this, this uh, east west axis of trade and we're going to go to Lalibela. And following trade routes south along the Swahili coast, um, we're going to stop in uh, Hasuni Kubwa, and then we're going to end in Great Zimbabwe. Um, all right. So, uh, so let's begin at our site uh, at Ayid bin Hadou in, in southern Morocco. It's located right here outside of Werzazet, which I think may or may not be on your sheet. Um, um, but before we do that, let's get sort of a, a sense of a historical backdrop. Um, it's the middle of the 8th century, and the Arab conquests under the Umayyad dynasties based in Dina Damascus are penetrating full force into the Maghrib, which is um, the westernmost region where Islam uh, spread. It's actually the Arabic word for, for West. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you see, uh, right here, there's the, um, there's this, uh, east to west, um, line of, uh, line of movement going on. And, um, and I, I also want to, want to stress one thing, you know, typically we always think of, um, people from the Maghreb as Berbers, but, um, just to, um, dispel this misconception, the term Berber is actually derived from um, the Greek term barbaros, which means barbarian. Um, and this, you know, really we want to call these people uh, what they call themselves, which is imazirin, which means um, free men in their, their own language. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the Imaz imazirin people put up a fight um, against Islam um, uh, and the incoming Muslims in the 8th century. But the advantages of um, fully submitting to the religion far outweighed um, the disadvantages posed by rebellion. So by 1100, um, the Maghribi kingdoms um, began to mobilize their power and it's under the El Muravids, or uh, as they're called in Arabic, the El Murabitun, right up here from 1050 to 1140, 
um, that they really seized power over all of Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, um, and the Iberian, Iberian uh, Peninsula as well. Um, but protecting this territory wasn't an easy task for the Almoravids. Um, and they had to build strongholds to sustain their hege hegemony. Um, Ayat ben Hadou is an example of this type of defen defensive architecture. Um, um, and it is essentially a, a casbah, which I'm sure you know, you've all heard from uh, <laughs> the Clash's popular song. Uh, means, uh, it means, uh, it's the Arabic word for fortress. Um, and, uh, and these people clearly did not want their casbah rocked. So, um, so to do that, to keep it from being rocked, they they built um, high um, uh, high mud and stone um, walls. Um, you know, demonstrated uh, here. Actually, this is um, and you'll see these these crenellations, which are these tiny slits. Or actually, you know, they're not tiny. I mean, they're they're slits slit windows. Um, that were used, you know, to to shoot uh, arrows and other other weapons. You know, it's I mean, it's a defense mechanism, and also you know, keeping keeping sunlight out, keeping um, the cool uh, the you know um, cool air within the the structures themselves, um, and the roof terraces um, are often. Um, laid with um, beams of the trunks of palm trees also to um, to sort of in insulate um, to some extent. Um, today its inhabitants moved from from the former um, Qasr, this word Qasr in Arabic is castle, so this former um, fortress to the new area across this wadi, which is a, basically a, a river valley, I mean, as you saw in the previous um, picture right here, there is sort of this um, slight river. Um, uh, and it's, you know, now a blessed UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, so, uh, so why is this, why is this so important? Okay, um, basically, uh, in this region of Morocco, you have in you know this Werzizet region, you have more than 300 um, uh, out of the thousand or so kasbahs that have been identified in the whole country. Now that is a huge concentration of kasbahs in in one region, and you know it's by it's it's no accident that they are all in. In that region, because you know there there's this huge um, monopolization on the trade routes, and um, Ait bin Hadou is actually on a route. Um, it it it's, has a strategic location on the route to Marrakesh and some of the imperial cities. Okay, so where are we going next? Well, right now we're going to um, the Great Mosque in in Jenny in Mali, um, and. You know, we're going to follow basically not these two lines specifically, but lines that uh, of trade that connected the two regions. Okay. Um, okay. So the rise in exports of uh, West A West African gold, ivory, salt, and slaves uh, were major factors in the rise of the grassland kingdoms. Um, but what's unique about Jenny is that it, as a city, it was never subsumed into any kingdom and remained independent, um, even though it did benefit from the stability of the Ghana Empire and the gold that it thrived upon. Um, in fact, uh, um, most of the, the first um, large-scale states um, with capitals located near the desert fringe um, also predate Muslim trading contacts. And in, in Jenny specifically, there have been Hellenistic beads that have been excavated at the site, um, which date back to 250 um, before the Common Era. Um, by 700 uh, of the Common Era, 
a solid trading network was established and taking shape in West Africa, um, as you'll see uh, in this map in slide 11, um, we have you know, these S's, which indicate salt, um, G's, which indicate gold, um, and you know, they're, they're just, they're all over the place. And this, this circle right here is the former Ghana um, empire, and right here is Jenny. Um, just outside of it. Okay. Um, and, you know, even though, one thing to keep in mind, even though Mali, about 90% of the population now, practices Islam, we have to remember that back in, you know, the year 1200 or so, you know, it was still a site of religious con contestation. And, um, and, you know, there, I mean, you know, um, uh, native pra religious practices were still um, sort of, you know, practiced in secret or, you know, tried to mainly keep it hidden from the Muslim population. Um, okay, so let's look at the Great Mosque of Jenny. Um, although the original structure of the mosque date dates back to the 13th century, this is a typo, it should say 13th, um, when it was founded, um, by, by a local um, Jenny uh, chief named Kunboro. Um, by the early 19th century, it was largely demolished and then uh, reconstructed in similar form, um, trying to be true to its original form under the French colonial direction in 1907. Um, so right here you see the, this is the Qibla wall, which um, faces Mecca and the souk, which uh, I, I haven't read anything specifically, but my assumption would be that um, there is probably some sort of waqf or um, institution or like a charitable endowment that um, instituted the presence of the marketplace. I don't know if it, if it was already there before the construction of the mosque. Anyways, um, so let's check out this YouTube clip. clip. Video removed due to copyright restrictions. That's it, that's that. Um, so to return, um, we have a, a plan of the mosque which features, you know, this, this transverse nave, you have the women's gallery in the back, um, a hypostyle uh, hallway, or hall, courtyard, um, rather, and uh, the, the entrances uh, of the mosque are on the north and south, south ends. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the um, palm, um, uh, uh, st palm structures, they, they really were, you know, the, helped, um, they still help um, the local masons um, with the, uh, perform the reapplication of mud and so on. Um, and uh, to, what, what's really phenomenal about the mosque in general is that, you know, during the day, it, it, the mud um, soaks up all of this heat from the sun, and, uh, and yet the mosque stays cool during the day. And at night, because it has absorbed all of this heat, it then, you know, provides um, warmth um, in the in interior of the mosque. Um, and the, you, I don't, have an image here, but there are actually um, ceramic pipes that were um, built to um, to lead the drainage uh, away from the mosque and uh, the building itself to prevent um, further de deterioration. Um, so that's that's that. Okay, so where are we going next? We're going to the Dogon communities, also in Mali, in the uh, Mopti region. Um, and we're following, you know, more or less the, the same trade route. Um, so these, you know, at, at first glance, they seem chaotic, right? I mean, you have this aerial view um, that's, that's from, a, from a high, uh, high distance above ground. You know, it's, it just, it looks, it looks like a mess, but it isn't. Um, in the 12th century, um, these communities started 
um, on the edges on the edges of this sandstone escarpment, which you'll see right right here, um, hidden sort of in in this cliff, um, and um, it's believed that you know it was started by descendants of an early Iron Age community. Um, their villages are highly organized according to a cosmological system, which is at the core of the Dogon uh, people's belief system. Um, you know, right here, you see a, a, a plan of basically what um, the people living in this region think is uh, you know, that they structure their homes according to this idea of a world egg, that the world as we know it is disseminated um, from a seedling from um, from you know this this idea of of reproductive reproduction and and fertility um, and you see interestingly you see the outline of a man in a fetal position um, which of course reinforces this idea that you know the home that domestic space is a womb it is a, a site of uh, of birth um, a site of generation or of, of uh, a generative um, in its capacity. Um, and right here you have these, um, this is just an example of some of the artwork um, created by the Dogon people um, in uh, carved, um, figures carved out of wood um, having apotropaic um, value, talismanic value. Um, and uh, in the image on the left, you see um, these granaries, which um, are thought to um, uh, have both, you know, this 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 conical phallic shape and a hollow, you know, vaginal shape, which of course reinforces the whole um, reproduction fertility trope. Um, the houses and the granaries are built. Um, out of a combination of mud and stone, and uh, with the addition of, okay, uh, with the addition of um, the, um, yes, <laughs> decoration, decorative, um, right, doors. Um, so we're going to cut across to Lalibela, um, located in what is now Ethiopia. Um, Christianity was first established in Nubia in the fourth century, um, and it had a powerful religious presence, you know, um, of course, way beyond uh, colonial, um, uh, colonial influence and proselytization. Um, under the Zagwe dynasty in the 12th century, central authority in the north was established and the capital shift shifted from Aksum to Lalibela. So Axum is right here to Lalibela, just south of it, um, in the Lasta mountain range. So here the, the maintenance of a religious economy was vital to the actual economy. And it comp composed of the, key, the king, um, priests, and farmers. Um, now this image right here, taken from Professor Jarzambek's article, is actually of um, the church of uh, Yamrahana Christos, not of Lalibela, but um, I included it for the sake of um, conveying this idea that um, both structures um, uh, used this very intricate system of uh, hydroengineering, collecting water um, from um, um, from the base of the ch of the church, from this uh, basin structure, um, and also, you know, um, it should be noted that King Lalibela um, controlled the water supply and marketed marketed it as such as holy water um, to entice pilgrims, which in turn helped help the economy. Um, the water basin at the base of uh, of this Church of Saint George. Um, leads to its own spring. And the man who is um, supposedly built um, this complex system, hydroengineering system, um, is named Abba Libanos. Um, it's contested whether he was from Lebanon or not, um, but he um, was responsible for this um, 
uh, building of artesian wells um, to distribute water. Okay, so next we're going to move to uh, Husuni Kubwa in Tanzania, um, current modern day Tanzania. Um, and we need to situate ourselves historically a bit. Um, the, uh, the language, um, Swahili, um, is a, really a creolized language, you know, on the, on the Swahili, on the East African coast, um, but it is Bantu in its structure. And if you remember from a map I showed earlier, maybe you don't, but the Bantu, Bantu peoples really spread um, east and on to the west. So, I mean, it just shows that the, because Swahili as a language is um, mainly has Bantu gra grammar and structure um, that, you know, the, even though there was, you know, Arab influence, Arabic words, Hindi words, Portuguese words imported into the language, um, its structure at its core was, uh, was uh, from another region of Africa altogether. So um, what was the impetus for um, this coastal trade? Um, sorry. Well, um, the Mongol invasions of the 13th century had, a hu had huge repercussions on world history. And even when Genghis Khan died in 1227, his empire was still growing. Um, masses of people in Iran and Central Asia were wiped out. And in 1258, uh, Baghdad was entirely sacked, which led to decline of the Abbasid Empire, or Caliphate. Um, and, you know, everywhere the Mongols went, they plundered their subjects, turned uh, them into serfs, and, you know, taxed them ruinously. But uh, that said, they had complete control over this whole vast expanse of land. Um, the different shadings indicate um, uh, Genghis Khan's um, successors, his four sons who uh, mainly, you know, divided up this, this region for administrative purposes and also purposes of rivalry. Um, uh, but the, the, but the Mongols actually, you know, uh, contributed greatly to the, the established trading networks and through their JAM system, which was a postal system, uh, which is pretty much, you know, I mean, for its day, it was equivalent to our modern day FedEx. I mean, it was pretty remarkable um, with the speed that they were able to get things to and from places. Um, so basically, excuse this map, I know it's a little busy, but um, uh, basically because of the, the effect of Mongol conquests, everything shifted downward. Um, not everything, but you know, there was this shift downward. And Shibin will talk about that somewhat in his talk, um, focusing in on the area of the Indian Ocean. Um, but to return to our um, point, um, and also monsoon cycles um, uh, also regulated maritime trade too, had to be um, in tune with the weather. Um, This isn't, this, these are just more trade routes. All right, so now we turn to Husuni Kubwa, which was a palace. Um, it literally means, um, uh, it literally uh, means large fort. Um, and it was um, built at the entrance to the harbor of Kilwa. Um, it was constructed on a high sandstone headland and it was actually built out entirely out of coral, which is amazing if you consider, I mean, that all of this coral from the, the reef just outside of the, off the mainland um, built this, you know, entirely intricate structure. Um, here is a digital reconstruction of what is now, in, you know, unfortunately in ruins, but um, just to give you a sense of what the building composed, here is a reconstructed uh, floor plan. We have a stairwell, which is located right here, that um, basically also, I think, is right here. Um, 
or actually wait, no, right here, excuse me, stairwell, um, that would lead into what is, uh, what were storage rooms all around this quadrangle. Um, and uh, as goods were being um, received, they were recorded and taxed, and this, this fort um, provided great surveillance uh, over what was incoming and outgoing. Um, and uh, also you have this, this sector is sort of the Sultan's um, private headquarters. You have an audience hall, which is thought to have been the place where the Sultan received his, 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 uh, his uh, courtiers. Um, and you also have a swimming pool. That's not a dome, it's a swimming pool, um, interestingly enough. And these are all like private rooms for wives and children and so on. Um, and uh, actually, um, the uh, Diwan, which was featured, yeah, the Diwan actually was right here, where he received his courtiers. Um, a Chinese Yuan Dynasty flask was found on the floor of the private head, private quarters, dating to about 13, 1300. So you know there is archaeological evidence that states that um, this was a site of international trade. Um, so now we want to move to our last site, which is Great Zimbabwe, um, and let's uh, let's take a, a look at it. All right, but before we do that, um, I just want to reinforce again um, that iron working uh, and iron smelting really spread with um, the Bantu dispersal, and which led to um, you know where we're, we're concentrating on Great Zimbabwe right here. Um, so, okay, so what is um, Great Zimbabwe. Okay, there's a picture of an Oroch bull. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, the Manamatapa Empire um, built an elliptical granite stone, uh, stone wall with a tall mon monument uh, in the valley, which is sort of right here, this conical structure, which is not, its purpose is not really known to scholars. It could be a granary, it could have been a treasury, it could have been a whole slew of things, but nobody is really quite certain as to what it was. Um, these walls were key elements to the governments that formed in the region between the 11th and 15th centuries. Um, its walls, believe it or not, are uh, 10 meters high and an average of three meters thick. Um, and, you know, I mean, this calls into question, you know, to what extent was this intended for defense? Um, some scholars have postulated that um, that because uh, the domestication of cattle spread southward, you know they needed structures to enclose the cattle. Um, but having walls three meters thick, I mean, rarely. I mean, it really doesn't explain much in terms of keeping cattle. They're not going to bust through, you know, three meters of wall. Um, but anyways, um, you see, uh, you know, really, um, hold on, uh, you see really, and um, uh, a lot of Chinese porcelain that's been excavated, um, like in Husuni Kobwa, um, and the luxury, these luxuries, of course, you know, point to the existence of a social elite, um, which, you know, points to these uh, really complex um, soci society. Um, but eventually the site was abandoned and um, scholars, you know, think that this is probably due to either drought or disease. Um, but unfortunately, um, when the site was uh, excavated uh, or colonized rather by Cecil Rhodes, what, you know, this area was once called Rhodesia, um, much of the artifacts were pillaged. So uh, that's, that's what you get for colonization. But um, 
I hope today I've demonstrated that, you know, architecture, African architecture is neither uniform nor simplistic nor dying at, um, as the BBC might have us believe. Um, rather, it's diverse and rich and its societies reflect neither the chaos nor disintegration um, that uh, misconceptions um, perpetuate. And to appropriate Oakley and Wazer's term that I mentioned at the beginning, um, it's through this lens of uh, Afro-optimism, rather, uh, that we might look at Africa and its architecture and global interactions um, with a more positive outlook. Thank you.